Dr. Tara Fitzgerald, how are you? Thank you for being here. A great. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, it's an honor to be with The you. honor is completely mine. I want to, to tell people something that probably they don't know, and is that Dr. Fitzgerald was my teacher when they studied the Institute of Functional Medicine back in 2012. Well, she was my teacher for the new module. I was five, 11 years, I've been, I've been already, but, and we're very passionate for what we do. So, so thank you for your work. Thank you for your generosity of working with us. And um, I, I, I would well, like you to let us know what you do, what's your work. I am a naturopathic physician by training. So my medical school training uh, consisted of sort of some of the standard coursework that you find across medical schools. Um, but then my focus was on integrative medicine, on natural therapeutics. When I completed medical school, I went to a laboratory, uh, a clinical laboratory, specialty laboratory, where I did a deep dive into nutritional biochemistry and a, a concurrent residency. So I saw patients on one hand, but the bulk of my time was um, in a laboratory uh, because I was just, I think, similar to you, just very, very excited about the possibility and promise of, of nutritional biochemistry and systems medicine. And um, so that was my early training. And um, after that, I joined the faculty at IFM and I've mostly trained professionals in my career. I published, I was a contributing author to the textbook for functional medicine and laboratory evaluations in integrative and functional medicine. And I published a collection of case studies in functional medicine, all of these for the professional and, and, and you know, published in the peer reviewed literature as well. This is fascinating because a lot of people, everyone wants to live longer. Not everyone is thinking how to live better. I mean, those two terms about lifespan, but health span, how they go one with the other. I think they're very necessary and we need to remember that we don't need to be an old guy for a long time. We need to learn how to be younger. So, and this is That's right? awesome because we see, we see a lot of, exactly. How do we live young? Yeah. For the longest? We see a lot of patients <laughs> that they're on their, on their fifties that they look very old and we think that it's a metal that we're going to get from bringing them to live and feel their. Aiden, you, you were mentioning a term that we yeah. really love, and, and I would like you to bring down so people can understand well the term epigenetics. It's something that really brings up, My brings our attention for a lot of years, and I, I learned it when I trained with you 10 years, 11 years. It has been fascinating. Could you please, uh, please tell us exactly what is epigenetics? Epi is from the root word above, epi, and genetics, of course, are genetic material. So it's above the genes. It's the, the influences above the genes that regulate what genes are on and what genes are off. Embryogenesis is a time where we the, the fate of, pluripo of stem cells is being decided. So for instance, you've got pluripotent stem cells when you're, you know, when you're building a baby, and some of those cells will become brain cells. Some will be skin, some will be eyes, some will be heart, et cetera. And the way that those cells are defined is through epigenetics. So different biochemical marks are allowing a gene to be turned on, you know, a gene that will go on and make a heart cell, for example, and then different biochemical marks will, will turn them off. Uh, and those genes, those changes, those biochemical marks will last a lifetime. So a skin cell will always be a skin cell, will always be a skin cell. But it turns out, like beyond uh, embryogenesis, how we're living, what we're eating, what we're thinking, whether we're sleeping or, you know, our, our exposures to toxins, all of the choices that we're making day in and day out. And in fact, some of this can actually, you know, we can be influenced by our grandparents or even our great grandparents' choices. These things also determine what genes are on and what genes are off. Fascinating because when we go to medical school, we think that diseases come because something weird happened on the cosmos. 
that I'm, I'm just cursed and I, I, I didn't want the hypertension and now I get this. I didn't want it to have diabetes and now I get this. We're not ever responsible from any single disease that we get. And of course, if we're not responsible of the, of the cause, how am I going to be responsible for treating this? We know that there are a lot of things that we, I mean, that we can do in order low aging to revert the, that aging process in order to turn down genes that were switched on in order to avoid switching them on if you already have them. But people think that this is something for the elite, that this is something very complicated, that this is something that comes in extremely expensive, weird uh, supplements or things that you only get on the Tibet. What are the things that we need to focus on? that anyone in every, any part of the world can start doing in order to, to do something about their epigenetics. Such a good point. It is this whole idea of sort of biohacking, so, you know, reversing biological there. age. Um, I know in the States right now, there's a, there is, there's a gentleman who's getting a massive amount of tension for his, I don't know, multi-million dollar investment into reversing his bio age. So just millions of dollars. This guy has reversed his bio age, I think, by five years. Uh, he's just gotten a ton of press. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen him. One of, one of the most... Yeah. Have you seen him? Yeah. It, one of the coolest things about our study, and in fact, one of the peer reviewers when we published this said it, and I really, it, I just really took it to heart. He said... This is broadly adoptable. Like the, these are diet and lifestyle things that any of us can do, no matter where we are in the world. You know, no matter what our economic status. Um, things like, you know, access to uh, some level of fresh food. Can we, you know, access to vegetable access to you know fruits especially berries but really any green tea or even black tea even coffee but a, but really a whole foods uh plant-based diet and we focus on specific nutrients to help with a certain type of epigenetic expression called DNA methylation mm -hmm. but it's primarily a whole foods getting sleep moving our bodies paying attention to some, ex you know, about the, our stress exposure or actively doing something to turn the volume down on that toxic, relentless stress. Again, you're bringing up things that you can you could do every single day, anywhere. Yeah. There's something that you didn't mention, but I've seen you talking about it. Sure. I think it, it's uh, something that could be important. And something that people need to remember that it's a tool, but it's not the magical, magical tool, which is fasting. What have you seen of the influence of fasting related to epigenetics? And yeah, what are your thoughts on the difference? Because I, there is a, for me, there's a big difference in between, or if you have any experience on the difference in between caloric restriction versus fasting, but eating all your uh, nutritional required so definitely caloric restriction has been shown you know as a standalone intervention to slow the the pace of aging caloric restriction um there is you know if the calorie study is pretty famous where they started at a 25 percent restriction they ended up over two years maybe ending at about 10 percent. so kind of a modest reduction over time but that slowed the the pace of, of aging significantly in those participants. In our study, we did a very modest um, time restricting structure. So we wanted this to be broadly adoptable. We wanted most people to do it without anxiety or stress or anything like that. So we just did, and, and we also, I suppose, as importantly, we didn't want to just study the influence of fasting. We wanted to study nutrition, sleep, uh, exercise, and stress management with a meditation program. We wanted to study a, a, an entire lifestyle event, so we didn't want to have any single variable kind of dominate. So we did 12 hours on, so 12-hour eating window, 12-hour fasting window, which is the most modest yeah. window, I think, to show benefit. I absolutely 
believe that if we extended that to perhaps a, you know, 16, eight, so 16 hours fasting, eight hours eating, uh, using the other components of our program that we would likely see a uh, better outcome. I mean, that's, you know, that's my hypothesis. I haven't studied it yet. Is that people think that fasting, it's eating less. And I remember my patient said fasting is eating less frequently not eating less. I always give the example is that if you're going to eat nine apples, instead of eating three, three, and three, you're going to eat four and five. You're not going to eat less. You're going to eat less frequently. And you're going to do it in a narrower space of time. Yes, yes, yes. It's extraordinary the information that we receive, like that are, you know, the biochemical changes that happen when we're in a fasted state. I mean, that, those changes that occur are profound and powerful and essential uh, for health as much as the information that we put into our bodies in the form of food. So we need both pieces of information. The information we derive from, you know, an absence of calories when we actually feel a little bit hungry, and then the information that we give our bodies when we consume healthful, good quality foods. Kira, there, there is something that we just spoke about the oh. things that we can do in order to to aim uh, a positive way for epigenetics and for healthy aging and for healthy anti-aging. But what are those things that are detrimental for health? I think we understand those variables really, really well. You know, especially yeah. uh, you know being here in the states. You know, we know that the final sixteen years of the average person in the U.S. Their, that final their final 16 years will be spent sick. I mean, we really need to ask ourselves if, if that's the fate that we want, because that's the fate that most of us end up with. We will spend our final 16 years with multiple diagnoses on multiple medications. I mean, it's it's. I think it's important to just say it straight. We will spend our final years sick. We will be giving our children's inheritance to the uh, medical system, to big pharma, to hospitalizations, to, you know, extended care facilities. I mean, we need to be very open about our fate. And this is the fate, not just in the States, although it's very marked here, but in many countries around the world. In fact, it's the exception where we don't see this. Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, it's been an honor. Truly, truly an honor. Thank you for everything. Thank you for all you've done for me and for everyone since for all of these years. And I hope uh, this is just the beginning of having more conversations like this. And I hope uh, that we're going to be a little bit closer that we can share a some work and maybe, maybe work something that I'll hope to see you very soon. <laughs> Thanks for again for your time, your generosity, and see you next time. Thank you so much. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.